right, how's it going everybody? Uh, we're going to start with our, our first video lecture here today. Um, get started with our chapter one topics here, introduce our ideas about uh, probability and statistics here, kind of get ourselves set up for the types of questions that we want to be trying to ask and answer this semester. <clears throat> um, and so this will mostly follow the ideas in section 1.1. For those of you guys, you know, reading the section as you're supposed to be doing here, um, what you should be finding is that section 1.1 really just has a lot of definitions. There's not uh, a lot of excitement in section 1.1. There is just a lot of really important verbiage. Like we're going to be using all of those words that you're finding out there in bold all semester. Um, so it does matter that we know what all these definitions are that you're seeing out there. But um, kind of the intention of this video lecture here is to give you a better feeling for what are we actually doing this semester? I, I often find that, um, you know, when students, if I were to ask a, a random student, like, what is calculus, uh, especially if they've never taken calculus, they have a really hard time answering that question. They, people don't really know what are the concepts associated with it. On the other hand, if I ask people, like, what is statistics, uh, it's very often the case that people feel comfortable at least believing that they understand what statistics is. Um, but then what I often find when I teach the class is that what people thought that we were going to be learning about in the class is quite a bit different than what we actually end up doing. Um, so kind of my mission today is to sort of uh, help you understand what actually is the uh, the role of statistics uh, in society. Why are you taking this class? What are the things that we hope to be able to do uh, by the end of this class based on our study of statistics? Um, and I think the big uh, the, the kind of core idea here that I want to push on you today is that statistics is very much not about computing a number. Um, uh, and I guess part of our, our issue here, and you can see up on the screen next to me here, that when we talk about what is statistics, uh, there's kind of two, two different definitions of the word based on how it's used in, in a certain context. Um, a statistic, as a definition that you have seen in your book, a single statistic, a statistic for something might be like an average or a standard deviation. A statistic is a computed value from data. However, when we talk about what is statistics, in fact, I can even go so far as to say that Microsoft Word got mad at me. It gave me a little grammatical error for even saying what is statistics instead of saying what are statistics. But when I say statistics in this sense, I'm meaning the study of statistics. Like what is the, what is the purpose of performing any statistical computations that we would want to perform? So that's going to be kind of our, our goal of kind of feeling that out. This, this video should kind of help you get a good sense of what are the, the, the questions that we're trying to answer this semester. So um, how, how should we then define the study of statistics? Um, this is one of those things where we should go take a look and see what the book says right here, and then we'll decide right away that we maybe don't care that much for that definition. So, and I'm going to say here, this isn't uh, our, what our, our, our book's fault here. I, I can say that I don't think I've ever seen an introductory statistics book where I've been like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a really good statistics definition right there. It's just something that's really hard to call out in like one sentence. Um, so I don't really like this definition, but that's really nothing new here. So let's see what the book says and kind of pick it apart a little bit. What our book uh, states here, this is our direct quote from the book. This is, uh, this is like literally like the first sentence of the second paragraph of uh, the content of the book here. Uh, the science of statistics deals with collection, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. So I just want to say like, what do I think is good about this? What do I think is bad about this? Um, I don't know, let's start with positives here. What do I think is good about this definition? Um, one of the things I actually like about this definition is something that I generally otherwise wouldn't like in, in other definitions is the vagueness of how they say deals with. Uh, the thing I guess I kind of like here is they don't even attempt to pin down what they even mean right there. They just say deals with. I, I feel like it's a real a, a vague hand wavy thing right there, but that's kind of important because statistics does lots of different things. And so I think to try and list them all in one sentence would be uh, less helpful rather than more helpful. So deals with there, I think is intentionally and appropriately vague. Uh, that's good. Um, the other thing I do like here mostly is that they describe a process when they define statistics. What they didn't do is they didn't say some things in statistics are like averages. Like that would be a really bad definition because then it's uh, giving the idea that statistics are things rather than a procedure that we walk through. And I want us to be thinking very much of statistics as a procedural uh, uh, thing out here. So we can see 
that the and these words also by the way are listed in an appropriate order here first we need to do some collecting of data we need to analyze the data we need to interpret the data and we need to present the data these are all acts these are all actions that we perform with data um, and so i do think that we should be uh, at least getting the takeaway here that statistics is a data centered uh, study um, but i i kind of don't there, there's some things I don't like about this definition that I would also like to highlight. There's some things that I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a couple alternate definitions of statistics today from my end here. Um, one of the things I don't quite like about this statement about statistics is it really doesn't describe for us what are the representative tasks of statistics. Like what, what can we do if we knew statistics that we couldn't do if we didn't? Um, and this sentence doesn't tell me any of that right there. Um, and, and as I said, I think this is a place where students, in my experience in the past, have been somewhat misled in the sense that they feel like uh, what we end up doing in the class is not necessarily what they expected that we'd be doing in the class, right? The tasks uh, didn't quite align. So part of our mission today is going to be to look at what are the questions that we want to be able to answer? What are the tasks we'd like to be able to form? And this, this statement does a, doesn't discuss any of those at all. The other thing that I kind of don't like about this statement here is it doesn't directly tie statistics to science. Um, I think uh, an important thing for us to kind of do is to take a step out of our little boxes here. I think a lot of people uh, sort of accidentally live a bit of a horse-blinded life when they're when you're in college, it's not clear to you what information should be kind of relevant to how you make your decisions. And here's a, an, a, a way that I like to think about this. This course, Math 15, Statistics, is the single most offered course in the math department and at CR. And I think it might be like, it's like the number one or number two or number three most taken course by students at College of the Redwoods, all right? That should mean something to you. Like, why is that? Like, if you have, can't even think about why that would be the case, I think that's kind of crazy. Like, you should stop and say to yourself, like, what what is it that me makes it so that so many students are required to be taking this course? Why is this? And the answer is that this directly should be uh, about doing scientific things. What statistics is really helping us do is it's really the math behind doing science. And there are a very, very large number of scientific fields that any of us could be uh, uh, pursuing here. And so if you are doing anything that's related to science at all, then you have to be able to do statistics because statistics is the math that formalizes the scientific decisions that we make. Um, and so I, one of the things I, I somewhat don't like about this definition is that it does not directly tie statistics to science. And I, I think that that's a, a really important kind of association for us to make. Um, and so again, the reason why the statistics course is one of the most taken courses at College of the Redwoods is because it's not really possible to make good sense of science if you don't understand statistics, any of the computations that were happening when you did science. Uh, and so I, I would like to uh, sort of enforce that uh, association with science. And I'm going to make this con uh, connection over and over and over again this semester. So this definition sounds like it's trying to describe something that I am already familiar with. Um, I know that my level of familiarity with this uh, is probably higher than some other people. But when I was in grade school, um, second and third and fourth grade, I remember that I was required to do a science fair project uh, every year. And so that means that every year we would stop and we would take a week to discuss the scientific method and how we're expected to uh, follow the steps of the scientific method in performing our science fair project that, you know, took, okay, I don't remember it that well, it did take a semester, a year, whatever. But the point is, uh, I very much remember sitting in a classroom at age seven, eight years old and talking through the steps of the scientific method. And I think a really good thing for you to kind of keep in the back of your mind all semester is that everything that we do in this class is going to represent one of the steps of the scientific method or multiple steps of the scientific method. I think this is a good place for us to kind of always kind of pull our connection back to that. What we're doing broadly is we are doing science when we are doing statistics. We're just doing the computational end of the science. So let's take a look at the scientific method since that's kind of how I like to think about what statistics is. I like to think of statistics as the mathematical perspective of the scientific method or the mathematical component of the scientific method. It's how we do the computations uh, to compute things that just aren't obvious to us. So what is the scientific method? Well, maybe you remember this and maybe you don't. I feel like this was burned into my brain in, in early grade school, but I've, I've learned that that's a... Uh, 
not necessarily quite the case here. Well, when we're performing the scientific method, it matters that we perform all the steps and it matters that we perform them in order for us to be able to reasonably draw uh, sensible conclusions at the end. The most important thing that we always have to do first is form a hypothesis. Um, and right away, I'm gonna go ahead and wag my finger at future you. Um, it's really important that when we do science that we don't try and form hypotheses after we've performed the experiment or after we've collected data. Uh, it matters that we uh, avoid bias by forming hypotheses prior to having actually participated in the actual data collection and uh, analysis of the data out there. So forming a hypothesis very first is very important. Um, and again, that's something that you're going to see that there's going to be some small technicalities later this semester where some of you guys are going to um, feel inclined to go out of order. And I'm going to yell at you and I'm going to say hypotheses always come first here. It's the first thing we have to do in the scientific method. After we've formed an, a hypothesis, we want to perform an experiment and collect data Typically, these are listed as two separate steps in the scientific method. Um, I always list them as one step when I'm teaching statistics because it's really pretty rare in this class that we actually do our own uh, experiments um, to collect the data. Um, it's pretty, pretty much more typical in this in-classroom setting that uh, we are, in a sense, like given data sets that were collected uh, from other people that have performed experiments. So there will be uh, a, a small handful of actual us performing experiments and collecting data this semester, but that's in this course, we're really interested. I, I, I kind of like to think, I mean, that the math purpose of this course is all sitting there in number three, right? The data analysis, that is really kind of the, the math central step of the scientific method right here. So again, we won't do on our end too much of the performing and the collecting. We will talk right away in section 1.2 in tomorrow's lecture, we're going to talk about what are appropriate and inappropriate ways to collect data, what are appropriate and inappropriate ways uh, to perform experiments. We've got ethics as associated with uh, performing experiments. We have bias that we need to avoid associated with collecting data. So we will talk about those topics right there, but um, us doing those by hand this semester, step two is uh, typically something done by other, other researchers. We will take their data and analyze it and draw conclusions from it. All right. So when we analyze data, what that means is we would like to perform some computations with the data that we have to get some numbers but then we would like those numbers to really help us draw conclusions. So as I've said a couple of times now, I think that students sometimes come into this class with uh, different expectations about what our job is here. And maybe a different way for me to phrase that is, I think that a lot of students come into this class expecting to do steps one, two, and three, uh, where a lot of students expect that the goal of this class, since this is a math class, is to compute some numbers. What's going to be so much more important than the numbers that you compute is the decisions that you make based on those numbers that we have arrived at. So another thing I would sort of like to emphasize in this moment right here is that statistics is not an act of computing something. Statistics is the act of making a decision. Because it is a math and science-based discipline, we don't just make decisions willy-nilly. We make them based on relatively rigid sets of rules. Um, and so what we want to decide are what are those rules? How do we make these computations? How do we draw these conclusions this semester? So again, our goal is not necessarily this semester to calculate a statistic such as an average or a standard deviation. We're going to do that, but that is one small step on the way to the most important final step of actually being able to draw conclusions based on the values that we computed. So. Um, it's important that you don't think that the end of the road here is just getting a number out of your calculator. It's always going to be saying, so what does that number then mean to you? There's always going to be sort of a sentence conclusion rather than a numerical conclusion to almost everything of value that we're going to ask this semester here. So scientific method is something that we're going to keep following all semester. I'm going to regularly bring up, oh, this is part one of the scientific method. This is step three of the scientific method. Like kind of keep referencing back to this. Remind yourself that our goal this semester is to formalize how to do science. Um, and so you should think of this almost more as a generic science class than as a math class. This is, this is just a science class that only has math in it. Um, maybe a more appropriate way to think about this class. So uh, what we want to do then is I want to start thinking about some statistical scenarios that we could find ourselves in, in which we should talk ourselves through each of the steps of the scientific method um, and see what we think that we can do as far as drawing some conclusions here. Basically, our situation right now is 
I think that we all have a general idea of what it means to form a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess, right? It's, it's something that's a step up from a guess, but it's still mostly just a, only a statement of, I'm pretty sure this is what's happening. I don't have any data to support it. So hypothesis is, is essentially a, a fancy guess here that we're making. Uh, performing the experiment and collecting data, as we've said, we are not necessarily going to do that. I'm going to be handing you some data sets this semester. You're going to be finding some data sets this semester. The data analysis is really where we have a lot of learning to do. We don't actually know really how to do any of the analysis that we need yet this semester. So as we go into these examples in one second, um, step three is kind of our big missing step right now. Step four, drawing conclusions. I, I think that we're going to have a good intuitive sense of what types of conclusions we want to draw. But drawing those conclusions is going to be completely based on the data analysis that we don't quite know yet how to perform. So for right now, we're going to make guesses as to what conclusions we think we're going to be arriving at. But I'm going to obviously set us up with some scenarios where it's a little unclear and where hopefully it becomes obvious to you that we're going to need a little bit of numerical help to kind of uh, complete the picture on, on some of these examples here. So let's talk through some of these examples. Some of these are a little ridiculous. Some of these are not. Some of these are very simple. Some of these are things that we're going to revisit multiple times a semester. Others are little frivolous things that I came up with just for the point of argument here today. So let's talk through a couple of these um, examples. So, um, oh, and I guess the one other thing that I'll say here, um, it never ends up being a, a natural thing for a textbook to discuss each of these components of the scientific method in order for a statistics class. So while I should say we are going to focus very much individually on each of these four steps here at various parts in the book, they won't necessarily all come in order right here is maybe the one thing that I'll say here. We're really going to look at uh, performing experiments first, collecting data second, um, analyzing data third, and then making statements about hypotheses and conclusions fourth. So these will go a little bit out of order in the textbook, but we'll hit all these pretty specifically here. So, um, so let's take a look at some examples. Uh, and again, I want us to really think about like, what are we doing this semester? What are the questions I really care for us to be able to answer and start thinking to yourself, how are we going to figure out what type of math would really help us answer that stuff? So let's look at a couple examples here of what types of decisions we want to be making with the help of statistics. So example one. Uh, in this example here, uh, let's go ahead and say, suppose you would like to investigate the average arm span of adult males in the United States. You've been told that a person's arm span is the same as their height. An, adult, an average adult male height in the U.S. is 70 inches. One of the reasons I remember picking this uh, or choosing this example, this is one of those things that I just like think all the way, just like I was telling you, I remember like talking scientific method for a week in like second and third grade. I also remember the first data collection experiment that I ever like but you know like as a student you do these things where it's like oh like how many m&ms did you get which ones were brown which ones are red which ones are green right like your your first ever like look at statistics in school when you do those very basic data collection experiments i remember that my first one in like second or third grade or whatever it was was that we all stood up and we all measured our heights in inches and we all measured our arm span and compared the two and looked to see like our arm spans the same are they more are they less and this is where i kind of learned i think it's funny my takeaway from this wasn't the scientific method my takeaway from this that I remember is that like, oh yeah, arm span is about your height. And it turns out that that's actually a pretty good estimate right there. A person's arm span is very typically uh, very consistent with um, what their actual height is in inches. Um, some things I want to point out before I walk away from this example right here, you can see that I've put some words in italics. I think one of the uh, important things that you should get really used to doing this semester is being very specific. Here's some things I'm thinking right here about the specifics that I'm including. One, the word adult matters. If I'm just talking about average arm spans of males in the United States, then when I draw my sample, there might be some seven-year-olds and there might be some 30-year-olds. Obviously, seven-year-olds are going to have a much shorter arm span than 30-year-olds. So that would, that would be a weird, I don't even know what kind of conclusions we could draw if we were including people of all ages. So adult matters. And therefore, I have included that word adult in all of the other descriptors that I'm using in this statement. Very similarly, the word males matters. Since males are on average taller than females, I am also expecting that males on average have a slightly longer arm span than females. It matters that we're specific when we say these things. The third piece of specific specificity right here is that we are in the United States. I also know that uh, average uh, adult male height is not the same everywhere. Um, in countries where the average person has like lower nu average nutrition uh, when they're a child, you're going to end up on average slightly shorter with uh, 
comparably shorter arms, stuff like that. Um, so the U.S. is not quite the tallest country on average on Earth. I think that some, uh, I think that like Norway, Sweden, Finland, I think that one of three of those um, has a slightly taller uh, average adult height for males and females um, than the U.S. But we're up there. And part of the reason is just because we have, as an as a overall country, some just relatively low rates of like malnutrition and stuff, which is relatively prevalent in a, a huge chunk of the world. So... Um, so again, just the point here is to say it matters that I said in the U S because you're going to get some wildly different results. If you go to different corners of the world where there are people that are just shaped differently than they are here. Right. So, so again, I'm being technical here, and this is something that you should get used to this semester is that you need to be specific. If we just said arm span of adults or just arm spans, then that is a, a very non-descriptive. It's not really telling me what group of people we can draw a conclusion about. Um, so you're going to do some writing this semester and you're going to write a bunch of words a bunch of times like adult male in the U.S. All three of those modifiers have to be in there or none of our conclusions are going to make sense, right? So continue to be specific when you read specifics. You want to keep those specifics with you. So I've, no, I've laid out this example now, I think here um, we can see what we're trying to do. And what we know from the scientific method, if I scroll back up here, is that the first step in the scientific method is always going to be forming a hypothesis. So let's go ahead and state the hypothesis that we think we have that's associated with this example here. It seems like what we believe, it seems like our initial belief based on no science is that our arm span should match our height. And if our height on average is 70 inches, then it seems reasonable to me that a good hypothesis for us to form here is that the average arm span of adult males in the U.S. is 70 inches. That would just say it's matching our adult our, our height right there. And I'm just going to say it one more time and then I'll try and stop being annoying about this. I'm still mentioning what statistic we're computing, the average. We're still talking about arm spans. It's still for adults. It's still for males. It's still only for people in the US, right? We're being specific about what our population is, about where we're drawing our sample from. Um, and so, so those details matter there, right? So we've done our hypothesis. The next step in the scientific method is for us to perform an experiment and or collect data, right? So I'm gonna give you now a couple scenarios of some possible data that we might end up collecting. And we want to think about what conclusions should we draw? Again, I know that we don't quite know any of the data analysis steps. So this is the step that we're in a sense skipping right now. This is the gap that we're gonna to work to fill in over the course of the semester. So data collection. I'm going to give us a couple different scenarios here. And very importantly, uh, you're going to just see the word down here, analysis and small letters of the question mark, because we don't oh, stop, stop doing this. What are you doing? Because we don't know what we're doing there. We have we have no analysis ideas yet. But I think that we can make some vague ideas of what conclusions to draw from some of this data here. So here's my ABCD four different possible data collection scenarios. Um, and let's talk about these one by one. I'm not going to read all four out loud. Let's talk about A and then our conclusion for A. We'll talk about B, our conclusion for B. Um, so we'll draw four conclusions from these four scenarios. But again, we're missing the analysis. That's going to be a critical component here. Um, right now, we're just making guesses to our conclusions. We don't want to be guessers. The name of this class is not guessing. The name of this class is statistics. And so we would like to really pin down a computable answer um, when it's not super obvious. Right? So. Scenario A, you sample five males. Uh, I'm gonna assume that those males are adult in the United States. I ran out of line on that room. Five adult males in the United States and you find their average arm span to be 71 inches. What conclusion do we wanna draw relative to our hypothesis here? Well, I can see that 71 is not the same as 70. But a really important thing that I know is that there is lots of variability. I know that there are some people that have arms that are longer than their body height. I know that some people have arm spans that is shorter than their body height. I know that there's some people that probably have arm spans that's basically identical to their body height. There's variability in what people's arm spans are going to be relative to their body heights. Um, and so if I sampled five people within my population and I found their average to be 71 when I was expecting 70, that doesn't seem that crazy to me. I don't think that this is enough evidence right here to reject uh, our hypothesis. And this idea of accept, or excuse me, this idea of rejecting our hypothesis or not rejecting our hypothesis is going to be a, a very consistent theme this semester. We're going to look to make that decision regularly. So in this case for part A right here, I feel like I've got to say, 71 inches is technically not the exact number that we were looking for, 
but five people is very small. That does seem to be well in the ballpark of what I was looking for. So I, I can't really say that I can draw some serious conclusion from A. Um, I certainly could not go so far as to say, ah, our original hypothesis was wrong. That five males is a very small sample size. Now, in sample B, the only thing that changes is, excuse me, sample B, in data collection scenario B, the only thing that changes is we're now collecting data from 100 adult males in the United States. If we collected data from 100 adult males in the United States and found 71 inches when we were expecting 70 inches, this is starting to get a little suspect now. If I'm going to get that whole full one inch over um, on my average, and, and also like realizing here, we can certainly have any fractions of an inch. That seems maybe a little high for a hundred people. I mean, this means that we, if, if it really is the case that the adult average uh, arm span, adult male arm span in the U.S. is 70 inches, uh, then we would have had to have sampled a, a quite a few people that were above average more so than people that were below average for us to get a result that's a full inch over right there that's 71 so that one makes me suspicious i should say this is maybe sufficient evidence to contradict our hypothesis but i'm, I'm really unsure about that that's not uh, it's not really fully clear to me uh what direction we should go and so i, I kind of want to point out to you right now in part A, I feel pretty confident that I don't need to do a lot of math to know that I can't necessarily draw any strong conclusion from part A. It seems like we got to stick with our hypothesis. From part B, this is my, my murky waters right here. Part B is where it's really unclear to me if that is super weird or not. And I think to help us kind of feel this one out, we should all look at part C, right? And in part C, we're going to say, well, what if we sampled 10,000 males? and found their average arm span to be 71 inches. Well, if I say sample 10,000 people, then I'm pretty sure I have got a very good snapshot of what the overall population looks like. Even though there's something more like 100 million adult males in the United States, it's going to be very unlikely that I just happened to coincidentally grab thousands of people that were above average in arm span and just happen to not get many people that are below average in arm span in that sample. Right? So if I see 10,000 people in my sample and end up with something that's noticeably longer than our original 71 versus 70 here, I think that that serves to me as probably almost certainly enough evidence to contradict our hypothesis if i was going in there with my hypothesis of 70 inches and i ended up with the scenario of sample c i think i i think i would have pretty good mathematical justification in saying listen i think your your claim on the 70 inches is wrong i think that it's actually a bit bigger than that um, and so because this sample has a such a large sample size especially compared to the previous two uh, I feel a lot more inclined to believe this result is an accurate result. And so if it disagrees with my hypothesis, that, that might be a conclusion that we could end up reaching there. Part D is a little different here. You, uh, sir, hopefully I'm noticing that you can see a clear pattern in what I was doing with A, B, and C, just increasing the sample size, but something different changed in Part D. In Part D, I reduced this back down to a very small sample size. We're only checking 10 people. But another thing changed in part D. Our result, the statistic that we computed, our sample statistic of an average of 73 inches from our sample of 10 people, 10 adult males in the United States, was 73 inches. Now, this is a place where I, again, I can honestly say, I don't quite know what I know to feel about this one. 73 is very far off from 70. So on the one hand, this is a much more extreme distinction from our hypothesis than the 71s that we were getting in the previous three examples. On the other hand, this is still only 10 people in our sample right here, right? So uh, I don't know if I should ever trust any results that's associated with only 10 individuals in a sample. That's just almost never a big enough sample size to draw a conclusion. And another way to think about this is how weird is this? Well, I, if I'm just sampling people at random, I guess that I could see that maybe I just accidentally sampled six people on the basketball team. And now maybe my result there isn't too weird, right? So part D I think is a very difficult one to judge because our result is relatively far from our expected result, but there is not a significant uh, like volume of data that's supporting them. It's a very small sample size that's suggested over here. So. I can honestly say that D might be the one that I'm the least comfortable with making a conclusion about over here. Uh, D and B are the ones where I'm very uncomfortable. A and C, I feel quite comfortable with the conclusion that I draw. 
but D is a little sticky here. We're, we have extreme results, far from expected, but from only a very small sample size here. So it's not super clear to me um, what we're gonna do. Um, and so I'm just gonna say here, it's really not clear. And so I, I think that this little tiny word of analysis there with the question mark is just extra important right here. Uh, I would say scenarios B and C are vague to me and I would like a little bit of mathematical help for me to judge how weird was that? How weird is it to get 73 inches across 10 people for the average if we expected 70? Um, maybe that's not as weird as I think it is. We need a little bit more uh, information and techniques of computation to help us determine which of those are more reasonable. So the bottom line here is our conclusion that we're looking to draw is really just, do we agree with our hypothesis or not? Or maybe flip that statement around and say, do we disagree with our hypothesis or not? Um, and in some of these scenarios, you should feel very confident in agreeing or disagreeing. And in some of these scenarios, you should feel very much like you're kind of stuck in between. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, our next example here. This one will be our slightly more, this is, a, this is a doubly more ridiculous example. This is super ridiculous for two reasons. So example number two, aliens are observing Earth. We're gonna talk a lot about aliens observing Earth. Aliens observing Earth is a really great thing to talk about in statistics because uh, what we're talking about is a group of people that are very interested in learning something about something that they know nothing about, right? Aliens who haven't seen humans before. So aliens are observing Earth, but they're very far away. So it takes a really long time for any uh, any transmissions to get to them. So so let's just say that everything that these aliens are picking up is all from early 70s radio and TV, just based on the distance away from Earth there. They then they're sitting there, you know, they're 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 watching, they're listening to their 70s radio and TV, and they they hear an advertisement on the radio or on the TV, and this advertisement claims four out of five doctors recommend smoking camels. And they this this is enough to put them over the edge. Their interest is now fully peaked in humanity. Now that they know that four out of five doctors on earth recommend smoking camels, they decide to go to earth. They wanna really look into this. They've, they've just gotta know, do doctors on earth seriously, four out of five recommend smoking camels? This is, uh, they, this is, this is worth coming in contact with humans at this point for them. So they, they want to come over and check this out. So, uh, we need to form a hypothesis here for this, right? So what's the alien's hypothesis on this one? Um, one thing I want to do just very slightly to modify the way that I make my hypothesis is as we've been saying, we want to make sure that we're getting technical here. This is a class about science. Um, I, I do want you to think about this first and foremost as a science class. This is just a science class that we just only do math in, but this is a science class. Um, because it's a science class, you should be scientifically specific in the way that you say things. Um, so essentially our hypothesis here is just going to be four to five doctors recommend smoking camels. I'm just going to say that in a bit more of a mathematical, uh, co computational scientific way here and just say four out of five, four divided by five is 0.8. That is 80% of doctors that recommend smoking camels. So just saying this is a bit more of a proportion rather than as a fraction right there, I, I think is a going to be helpful helpful for the comparisons that we make later. I think generally referencing things as fractions is not going to be to our benefit uh, too much this semester, except for a few probability computations. So I'm going to state my hypothesis here. The hypothesis is that 80% of doctors recommend smoking camels. So what these aliens are going to have to do is they're going to have to go ask a bunch of doctors, right? So if they're going to do their step two, perform an experiment and collect data, the aliens are going to need to come to earth, uh, abduct a bunch of doctors and, you know, uh, put them on the torture chamber up in the alien craft and say, do you really recommend smoking camels? They got to find out the truth here, right? So uh, data collection, again, I'm going to give us a variety of scenarios here and we'll talk about what conclusions we think we should draw. Once again, we're missing our analysis step, our critical step three of analysis. We don't know any of that stuff yet. We're just trying to make guesses right now to feel out the questions that we want to be asking here. So scenario A, they sample 100 doctors and they find that 78% recommend smoking camels, right? So what we know is that 78% is not what we were expecting. We were expecting 80%. But an important thing that I really want us to kind of get at here, this is very similar to our, our A in our previous uh, example, which is that if I tell you to expect an 80% result and you end up getting a 78% result, out of a sample size of 100, that seems completely reasonable to me. If I see this 78% across a sample size of 100, 100 is a relatively large sample size, but not massive, right? It's not like it's all the doctors in the United States were sampled. It's only 100 of them, but this is much better than the five or 10 that we were talking about. So if 100 doctors were sampled, it's a good mid-range sample size number, 78 is certainly close enough 
to 80% in my mind for me to say, ah, so your experiment perfectly agreed with my hypothesis, essentially. You were just barely off right there. Um, and so again, we need to know that we should, we always have to have our minds open to the fact that there is variability in randomly selected data. If we are randomly choosing doctors, then we are going to get some variability in our responses. Even if it were totally true that if you actually took a census of all doctors in, in the US and it truly was 80%, it wouldn't be weird at all for you to sample 100 and get 78%, right? This seems like this is in a sense completely agreeing with our hypothesis, even though there is technically a little bit of error right there relative to this number. I, I can't think of anything I would expect much more to agree with than scenario A. So I would say this is not sufficient evidence to contradict, right? And so notice I'm kind of saying this in a funky way. We're going to talk a little bit more about our language uh, in some later chapters out here. Um, rather than saying this agrees with our hypothesis, I'm saying this doesn't disagree with our hypothesis. Uh, it's a little technical. We'll talk about that technicality later. but. Uh, Right now, we just want to get our feeling, agree or disagree. And here, I think we say this 78% essentially agrees with the 80% that we expected to see, even though they're different. We accept some variability in our data. Uh, sample B, they sample five doctors, and they find that 40% recommend smoking camels. Now, this is a really weird one right here. 40% is wildly far from 80%. Right? We all agree that 40% and 80% are not even in the ballpark of one another, whereas 78% and 80% are very close to one another. I think that ho hopefully, I mean, that's just sort of a judgment opinion statement there. I kind of assume everybody's on board with that statement, right? 40% very far off from 80%. But I'm going to do the thing I'm going to do a million times this semester and say, but what? Well, in this case here, I, I kind of feel like the sample size of five means the same thing it meant to me in our last scenario. We should really probably avoid drawing any conclusions. Sample size of five means that you straight up don't have enough data to really make a sensible conclusion. Here's a different way that I should ask this. Uh, we should be weary of percentages in our lives always because percentages are really hard to interpret if you don't know the number that they were drawn from. If I was telling you to expect 80% of doctors recommend smoking camels and we sampled 10,000 doctors and got 40%, that's hugely different than if we sampled only five doctors and got 40%. And the reason is, if I sampled five doctors and got 40%, that means that two out of five said yes. 80% would recommend or would suggest that four out of five said yes. So in a sense, when I think about what happened here in scenario B, we were only off by two doctors' answers. If two doctors would have said, yes, I recommend camels instead of no, then we would have hit our 80% on the head. Exactly right there, right? Being off by two responses is probably not something that we should say is strong enough to draw serious, significant, uh, serious statistical significant statements from. Um, so I'm actually going to say that even though this 40% is wildly far from 80%, you should not be drawing strong conclusions from anything where a sample size of five has been drawn. So this one, I'm just gonna say it's weird. Even though 40% is very far from 80%, I would never trust any study that was ever performed with a sample size of five. It would never change my mind about anything. So while it's totally insane that we would make the statement that 80% of doctors smoke camels, if I believed that originally, there's no way that B would change my mind. Five doctors just is not a large enough sample size to draw conclusions from. Finally, sample C excuse me, data collection scenario C, we sample 500 doctors, we find uh, maybe somewhat more uh, of our anticipated real life 2020 results right here. We find that only 1.2 actually, 1.2% uh, actually recommend smoking camels. Uh, very obviously, hopefully this 1.2% that recommends smoking camels is insanely far off from the 80% that we were originally expecting. 500 is a, certainly a large enough sample size for us to trust that this result is not just due to a very unlucky sample, like it could have just been the case right there. And so I think if we're looking at scenario C, this is probably what you'd expect if we actually did this experiment right here. Um, and this to me represents a very obvious rejection of the original hypothesis. If I originally went into the study believing that this was true, then I think that no matter what our analysis steps end up being over here, I 
it just has to be the case that whatever math we do for part C, it's going to suggest to us, obviously, to reject our original hypothesis and to change our hypothesis to say maybe it's actually less than 80% that are going to recommend smoking camels, stuff like that, right? So this is certainly a ridiculous example. We got aliens abducting doctors. We got 80% of doctors recommend smoking camels. Um, ridiculous, but... Uh, I like to bring this one up since this is just actually what advertisements used to say when my dad was, you know, in high school and college and that always cracks me up. So, um, so we'll talk aliens. We'll talk doctors recommend smoking uh, this semester as some of our uh, outrageous examples that we can see some of these obvious results that we expect, like in part C, obviously contradicts the hypothesis. We're going to want to see our math strongly agree with that uh, in a couple of weeks once we get to those parts. But again, a big part of this right now is we're skipping over all the math. The whole course is about filling in this little blank of analysis right here, getting the math to justify all these conclusions that we think that we should be making. So let's go ahead and look at example three. It's example three right there. Um, in example three, we're going to talk to you. My greatest disappointment with example three is this one takes a lot more uh, work to build up for us to be able to actually do this uh, type of analysis. So this is unfortunately uh, going to be held off until like week 12 of the semester where we actually come at this type of decision that we're making right here. Uh, again, this is my like favorite little unit right here is talking about these ones. Um, let's talk through this example here and we'll actually also get to look at uh, a little bit of me generating some data rather than just me making up some data here. So. So um, we're going to talk about our dice fair and how can you tell? This is a great uh, way to talk about statistics because everybody's rolled dice in their life. Um, we all have reasonable dice intuition. I am going to prove to you that your dice intuition is not as good as you thought that it is this semester. Um, and that'll be exciting. We'll look into that in the next couple of weeks here. That'll be earlier in the semester that we talk about our probability things. But let's just kind of define some things here. Um, a fair die, if I never reference, by the way, the number of sides on a die, I by default mean six-sided. I will definitely talk about plenty of other sided dice this semester. A 12-sided die, it's a 1 12th chance of landing on any of the faces, stuff like that. Um, but in, in general, if I never tell you number of sides on a die, it's six. So if I say a fair die, I mean a six-sided die that is equally likely to land on any of its six sides. A loaded die would be a die that is somehow not fair. One of the one of the sides is more likely than the others, or maybe many of the sides are more likely than others, right? It's just in some way, it's not equally likely across all faces. So the question is, if I gave you a die and you didn't know if it was fair or not, how many times do you think you would have to roll that die to be confident in knowing that it's fair or not fair. And this is a really hard one to ask. And I'm going to show you that I, I'm going to guess that your guess is, uh, is wrong here. This actually takes, in my opinion, quite a few more dice rolls for me to be sure uh, than I would naturally expect. And let me go through a few other scenarios before we actually kind of do this here. First example, if you rolled a die six times and got each value once, if you got one, 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 two, one, three, a four, a five, and a six, and you got each of them one time, is that enough for you to think it's fair? I would strongly advise you believing that that's fair right there. Notice that a sample size of six rolls, I would never make any decisions based on a sample size of six. Uh, if you rolled a die 20 times and got no sixes, does that convince you that it's loaded? And I can tell you, I have absolutely rolled a die 20 times in my life and not gotten a six. Like that probably happened to me a hundred times. I rolled a lot of dice in my life. I played a lot of board games as a kid. I did a lot of gambling in college. Uh, that is a completely reasonable outcome to get, even though it definitely defies what we expect our, our probability distribution for a fair six out of die to be. If you rolled a die four times and got four ones, is it loaded? And again, I'm going to say, Never make a decision based on a sample size that's that small. I have absolutely seen this happen more than once. I've lost a good chunk of money to ridiculous things like that happening in college. Uh, that the, These scenarios are, are, are quite a bit tougher to judge, I think, than our, our wingspan and our, our proportion uh, scenarios from before. Um, so let's state our hypothesis here. And I, and I want to talk about our hypothesis kind of two different ways. Again, I want to state sort of a generic hypothesis and then a mathier hypothesis. So our general hypothesis for any die, if we're going in, if I give you a die, I don't, I don't think 
in life, you're generally like suspicious, like, wait a minute, is this a, is this a loaded die? I think in general in life, you generally go into any scenario with a die believing that it's going to be a fair die, right? So I think that's a, a reasonable hypothesis for us to start with. Our hypothesis is that the die is fair. It's, it's always my default judgment. Um, how would I say this a bit more mathematically? What is, how does a, what's our mathematical way of saying the die is fair? Um, I'm going to use some of our vocab words here. The expected, in fact, I should even stick in an extra modifier here. The expected probability distribution of our results could be given by this table. Each of the rolls, one, two, three, four, five, six, the probability of seeing that outcome, a one-sixth probability for each. In this case, notice that all of our probabilities are equally likely. We will come to refer to this as a uniform distribution because each of our outcomes is uniformly has a uniform amount of probability associated with it. Other things in life are not uniformly distributed. There are some things that uh, some outcomes are more likely than other outcomes. So we will also look at examples in this scenario where we do have non-uniform distribution of expected results. So this is maybe my mathier uh, statement of my hypothesis of stating the expected probability distribution of our results. As usual, we don't have anything analysis to say right here, right? We don't know the computation. And like I said, this computation here will be a little bit stickier than some of the other ones that we do. By the time we get to it, it won't really be that hard, but it's it's just one of those topics that just has to be saved till slightly later in the book. Um, and to do this data collection, rather than me just make up some numbers, I figured I would have, oh, I do have analysis right there. I should move that guy up right there. Um, we're gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a computer generate some numbers for us. And the reason is, is I want you guys to really believe me that dice are less trustworthy than you seem to think they are. Um, I wanna, I wanna have a computer generate some random numbers for us here and let's see what we're really gonna get. So, um, this is something I'm gonna do a couple times this semester, um, is to, uh, uh, write a little bit of code that's going to help us interpret some of these things here. Um, you're going to see me use a little bit of Python. You're probably going to see me use a little bit of MATLAB. You're probably going to see me use a little bit of R. Um, this semester, I am not going to ever have you necessarily write any of your own code. It is going to be the case that I am going to give you snippets of output of code that I've written, and I'm going to ask you to interpret those outputs. Um, but when we get to those parts, you'll have seen stuff beforehand. We'll have, I'll, I'll talk through it. This is, I'm not just going to be like, oh, here's some gibberish from R that you've never seen interpreted. Um, I'll, I'll like help you out with those. But there will be some cases that uh, you will be expected to interpret some output from some programs that I've written. So um, that will come up a little bit. So this is maybe our, our first little introduction to uh, looking at some Python code here. So um, what you can see on the screen over here is all I've got is a couple little lines of code. I just want to talk this. This isn't too crazy here. I certainly don't expect you to like learn this or, or like know this or reproduce this. Um, but I think that this is something that's viewable enough that you should be able to vaguely see what it is that I'm doing right here. So what I'm first going to do is I want to create a list and the list is going to be all the rolls of the die. I'm going to roll, I want to roll a die 50 times, for example, to produce this right here. And I can change this number if I want. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to get a random integer. The integer can go from a low value of one. Here's a little bit of just stupid parts of this programming language right here. The lower bound is inclusive, so it does truly start at one. The upper bound is exclusive, so it goes up to, but not including seven. That's a little dumb right here, but that's just a little Python specific thing. Don't worry about that. This will give me values from one to six, and it will give me 50 of them. So this first line of code is just going to produce 50 random integers between one and six. Those are my die rolls. This second line of code right here is going to say, okay, take those 50 individual numbers and count how many of each of them occurred. How many ones, how many twos, how many threes. So my counts is going to just be a list of six numbers. It's going to be the list of how many ones, then how many twos, then how many threes, etc. I want to plot a histogram of the rolls that we got. And then I want to see what were the counts for my rolls, and let's take a look at the histogram. So that's what's happening in this code right here. So, uh, so I can just run this over and over, and what it's going to do is it's going to re-roll the die 50 times. It's going to count up how many of each thing it got, and it's going to build the histogram based on what it saw here. So I can keep re-rolling this, and so here's our first one right here. We got eight ones, 11 twos, 10 threes, 10 fours, five fives, and six sixes in this one right here out of our 50 rolls. 
And right away, uh, you should see some things that are a little bit weird. We got five fives, but we got 11 twos. We got more than twice as many twos as we got fives, even though this really is a fair die. This is uh, equally likely selecting each of these six values right here. Um, and so here's another one. So six, seven, 12, six, eight, 11. Um, this one, not too terrible right here. Again, we do have a six and a 12. So we do have one result being twice as likely as, or excuse me, occurring twice as often, even though it is equally as likely. Um, and the nice thing about writing this code is that I can just keep doing this over and over. Notice here we got four ones and 10 each of five sixes and sevens. <sighs> Holy cow. I mean, if I'm suspicious that my die is loaded and 30 of my results are in the upper half and only 20 of my results are in the lower half, I'm starting to get suspicious, but this turns out this is a fair die. So, so again, I, I, I want to kind of say to you, this one seems like it's a lot harder to make this judgment call on. Again, here's another one. We got six sixes, but 15 fives. That's two and a half times as many fives as sixes, even though this is a fair die. Um, I was getting some real, oh, see, I was getting some crazy ones earlier. Look at this, 14 twos, but only four threes. So that's three and a half times as many twos as threes, even though these were all equally likely. So a thing that you should notice here is this is getting quite a bit harder to judge. This truly is a fair die. And it turns out that this graph right here is actually representing 50 rolls from a fair die. I'm expecting this graph to really just be a flat, straight line all the way flat across. Now, how could I do that? What could I do differently to make this actually pan out to be uh, more like what I'm expecting? Well, what I know is my sample size is one of the things that's helping me trust or not trust this. I think I would be more confident in judging the validity of this die being fair. Uh, okay, actually, let me, let me back up one sentence here. The original question was how many times do you need to roll a die to be sure that it's fair? We've been rolling this die 50 times each one of these experiments. I, I don't want to look at this graph and say, yep, this is a fair die right here. I guess I would say the original answer to my question is 50 isn't enough for me to really feel confident about this. This graph to me just doesn't necessarily look like it's going to be a fair die. So what could I do? I could roll the die a bunch more times. So all I did is stick in an extra zero right there. So now what it's going to do is the exact same process. It's just going to roll uh, 500 times instead of 50 times. And we're going to see what our graph looks like. Now when I do this, what we're seeing is this graph looks a lot more like we're getting an equal number of each type of result right here. So while it's still the case, for example, that I got 10 more ones than I got sixes, that was a big distinction when we only rolled 50 dice. But when we roll 500 dice, getting 10 more of one result than another is not actually that big of a deal anymore, right? So another thing that we want to see here is that based on sample size and variability, the answers to how uh, our questions are going to vary, right? By me continually increasing the number of dice that we roll, if I now go up to 5,000, then now we're seeing that our results, I mean, this looks like a histogram that I very much trust to be representative of a uniformly distributed fair die. It doesn't look like in the long run we're getting anything to be wildly more likely than anything else. Um, and even here, you know, again, I was the last one, I'll look at the numbers. We got 49 more ones than either twos or threes. But that's not a big deal in the grand scheme of 5,000 dice rolls out there, right? This still looks to me like what I would estimate a fair die roll setup to be. So coming back to our, our um, what we were what we were kind of judging right here is how many dies does, or how many rolls of a die does it take for you to be confident? <sighs> the answer is kind of a lot. Like I, I would probably need close to like 100 rolls of a die if I'm going to be actually getting close to being sure. Um, as far as ballparking it goes, uh, I think that we're going to have some computation later this semester that's going to help us reduce that number a little bit. But uh, there is a big takeaway that I think that we can take from this, which is it's a lot harder to just judge non-mathematically if an experimental distribution agrees with a theoretical distribution than it is to judge if an experimental value, like an average, agrees with a theoretical value, like another average, right? So in our first two examples today, we looked at an average arm span, and we looked at a proportion of doctors, so an average and a proportion. Our third example today looked at a distribution, right? So the three things that we're gonna look to make decisions about this semester is, is the average what I think it is based on the data co I collected? 
Is the proportion what I think it is based on the data I collected? Is the probability distribution what I think it is based on the data that I collected? Those are really our three big statistical questions. And you should notice all three of those are yes, no questions. At the end of the day this semester, our goal is really just to make a bunch of yes, no judgments. We're going to make those yes, no judgments based on tables of data, based on lots of computations, based on understanding probability distributions. Um, uh, lots of calculation that we're going to do. The ultimate goal, though, at the end is to say, yes, that's what I expected, or no, that's not what I expected. Or in a couple cases, we'll get some fringe statements that are going to say things like, I can't make a decision right here. I would have to collect more data to be able to confidently say yes or no in this context right here. But um, really, we're looking for that line in the sand. How do we draw that judgment line of what's too much versus what's not enough? Um, and so this conclusion right here is really specific to our scenario three. In scenario three, we are asking, does our experimental distribution, the dice rolls that we got, does that agree with our theoretical distribution? Exactly an equally likely number. And we just saw it was weirder to judge that, I think. It's harder to make an eyeball estimate of that of entire distribution agreement than it is to find like does an average agree with another average does a proportion agree with another proportion those will be a little bit easier and that's why this example three is based on stuff that's going to be a little bit later in the semester it's just a little bit tougher to make that decision there so let's summarize kind of what we saw here today um statement i'm just going to make a couple statements that are what i think we should take away from today's lecture here statistics should be thought of as the mathematical side of scientific decision making the goal of this semester is not to compute numbers. The goal of this semester is to make decisions. We want to make decisions about scientific topics. When I say scientific, that means that we want to be technical and specific, not generic and vague. The mathematical side is just saying, this is just the computation that is associated with doing science and making decisions. Um, so you should think of this as a science class, not as a math class. This is just a science class in which we only do math. Our goal in this class is not to compute numbers. Our goal in this class is to make decisions based on numbers that we computed. Uh, and so maybe my final statement for this part of the decision making is it's going to be rare in this class that I ask you to give me a number as your final answer. That's always going to be like most of the questions in this class are going to be like do part A, B, C, and D. Part C is going to be you giving me the number. Part D is going to be you stating a conclusion about that number. That's always going to be the most important thing. Statistics is the study of formalizing the question, how weird is too weird? When we sampled, when the aliens sampled the doctors and they found that 78% instead of 80% uh, recommended camels, that's a little weird. It's a little different. Now, what if out of the 100 doctors that they sampled, it was 77% or 76% or 75%? Eventually, we would get down to a number where you'd say, you know what? That just disagrees too much with 80% for me to continue believing the 80% number. So at that point, you would either have to say to yourself, Either we just got unlucky and drew a very strange spread of doctors, or it turns out the 80% must have been wrong and we should reject our original idea. That's the decision that we're looking to make. Either we just got unlucky and got a weird sample, or our sample actually is representative of the population and our original hypothesis was wrong. This is our decision-making process that we're trying to do. We're trying to say, if our results were weird, were they too weird for us to continue believing our original thoughts, or are they weird but kind of within the realm of reasonability? We often go into scenarios with prejudgments of what we expect. These help us form our hypotheses. Some of the times our prejudgments are going to be things like a company claims that because there are often times in real life where companies want us to believe things that aren't quite true. Like a company claims that the level of carbon emissions that they're outputting is safe for the environment. We might want to do a study to verify that kind of things. Other prejudgments are going to be based on colloquialisms, right? Like, uh, the, which are things like, uh, I don't know, I think of this as like wives' tale knowledge. 80% um, of doctors recommend smoking camels is my stupidest example of this one. But other things like human average body temperature is 98.6 degrees. That's such a commonly known thing that there was a boy band named that in the 90s. Turns out that's actually not quite correct. It turns out that that's not a medically accepted fact that 98.6 is actually the standard average. That's not what a doctor would tell you. Um, that's just based on some maybe not great data collection from like the 1800s and it's just been held over that 98.6 is standard. So in that sense right there, 98.6 is in a sense sort of like wives tale type of knowledge. 
about what is typical. Um, and so that's a, that's a prejudgment where you could be like, I feel like this is the thing I know. I feel like I know the arm span is the same thing as height. That's my prejudgment. This is how I'm going to form my hypothesis. So sometimes hypotheses are a little more scientific. Some of, sometimes it's just like, uh, this is my default thought. Is this correct? So we'll get a couple different types of kind of, uh, sources of our hypotheses this semester. Uh, other summary statements here. Doing statistics is the mathematical act of computing whether or not what we observed was too weird for us to keep believing our original hypothesis or not. This is kind of coming back to what I was saying at the beginning. We're going to get results that don't exactly agree with our expectations, but sometimes we're going to say that's okay, and sometimes we're going to say, nope, that was too far from our expectation. That was too far. So our goal is to find this line in the sand of saying, how far is too far? Is what we observed too weird to keep believing the original thought? Or was what we observed just kind of weird, but not so weird that we throw out our original ideas? Um, finally, how we interpret our results depends heavily on our sample size and amount of variability. For this one very specifically, you should be thinking about my uh, the example and the scenario uh, with the aliens and the cigarettes and uh, when they sampled five doctors and got a result of 40%. If you told me that you performed an experiment that resulted in only 40% of doctors reporting that they recommend camels, that would immediately suggest to me that the 80% is wildly wrong. But if you didn't tell me that you only sampled five doctors, then you have wildly misled me. I need to know what the sample size is and how much variability I expect in individual responses to help interpret how weird my result is. 40% uh, is not that weird relative to 80% with a sample size of five because it means only two doctors voted differently than I expected. If we had instead sampled 10,000 doctors and got the 40% versus the 80%, then that would have meant that we were off by more like 4,000 doctors rather than like two doctors, right? Or 2,000 doctors instead of two doctors. That would be a much, much, much bigger difference. So knowing the sample size and the amount of variability is very, very important for actually interpreting the statistic that we've computed. So just because I've computed the experimental result of 40% of doctors recommend smoking camels, I can't do anything with that without also knowing how many did I sample and what was the uh, variability in their responses out there. So sample size and variability are crucial to our ability to take our uh, computation into a conclusion. We can't do that without knowing some of this context information of sample size and variability. So this wraps up the topics that I had to talk about today. This sort of covered 1.1, but this is also just sort of like my generic introduction to this class that regardless of what any textbook I'm using covers in section 1.1, this is always kind of what my day one looks like, which is what things do we do this semester? So. And that's fine because section 1.1 in this textbook is literally just a long list of vocab anyway. Um, it's not an exciting section. It just lays out all the words that we have to understand this semester. So it's really important. It's just a little, a little bland, which is why I leave that one up to you. Next video in section 1.2, there are uh, in general four topics that you should be prepared for me to be talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about types of data. We get some data that's numerical, like your arm span. We're going to get some data that's categorical, like do you prefer smoking or not? We're going to get um, some data that's numerical, like arm span, which can be measured very finely in inches. We're going to get other data that is like how many children do you have that can only take on whole numbers of, of values. So types of data is one of our topics here. Sampling methods. There's good and bad ways to collect data. There are ethical and unethical ways to collect data. Um, and we want to know about what's good and what's bad right here. Um, and we want to talk about what are the limitations. Like we can't just do things perfect all the time for lots of reasons. We want to know why. Uh, graphical displays of data. There are some graphs that are more uh, better suited for certain types of data than others. Depending on the type of data you've collected, there is probably a graphical display that is best suited to that. Also in here are a couple situations of when should you specifically not use a certain type of graphical display uh, because we don't want to be misleading with our data. Uh, and finally, a little bit more on variation and sample size. This is sort of the last thing that I just yelled at you about right here. Variability and sample size matter a lot. Uh, we've talked more about sample size so far, but variation is a pretty key part of that as well right there. So these are kind of the four topics in section 1.2. This is our next video. As you can see directly above my head right there, this one is going to be uh, tomorrow, the same time, 1030. So I'm going to try and do these Mondays, Tuesdays at 1030 for this stuff right here. Um, typically, we'll just do two videos a week. 
there might be one or two weeks where I think it will maybe be better for me to do a third video that might uh, kind of overlap. Right now we have scheduled on Wednesdays, our office hours fall at the time that I am doing these like right now. Um, so in there's probably gonna be a two or three or maybe four weeks this semester where I'll do a third video. And those will probably just fall into the same time slot on Wednesday. So that might kind of overlap an office hour. But I think in those situations, it's, it might be preferable to uh, cancel an office hour in favor of getting another video lecture out there. So um, yeah, if you have any questions about our one, one topics, anything in this video right here, uh, certainly feel free to uh, send an email, post some stuff in Canvas, stuff like that. Um, you guys should be walking through your three pre-assignments that are all listed uh, in your either your welcome info page or in modules, uh, the modules view week one. Um, you can do your pre-Canvas quiz if you've done your reading, which you should have done if you're watching this video anyway, um, and keep on working through this week's material. So again, stay in touch with me if you have any questions. Otherwise, uh, I'll be doing this again uh, tomorrow at 1030 and keep getting these videos posted in Canvas here. Uh, welcome to the semester. Happy, happy Monday, day one. And uh, I will see you guys next video.